In Last Night in Soho, Thomasin McKenzie plays Eloise, a young, aspiring fashion designer who moves from her rural home in England to the big city of London to study at the London College of Fashion. When she comes to the big city, it's not all she thought it would be, and she starts to retreat into a dream world, the London of the 60s. And in this dream world, she meets the dazzling wannabe singer Sandy, played by Anya Taylor-Joy. But these glamorous dreams are not all that they seem to be, and then the cracks start to show, and the story begins. Last Night in Soho came to me over a number of years. It's definitely been in my head for at least a decade. I, I started to realize that I'd started making the soundtrack compilation in 2007. So it goes back quite a long way. And I, I guess that's sort of true of the movie that the, the, the music is so evocative of the period that putting together some of the songs would start to make me think about the story. I moved to London 25 years ago and I've spent probably more time in the Soho district than any like sofa that I've ever owned <laughs> because you know it's somewhere to socialize you know uh, theater land and cinemas are in Soho and uh, lots of other nightlife music and comedy it's the center of the film industry um, and so I spent an enormous amount of time here because every movie I've ever edited has been edited in Soho and mixed and grayed and I've written films in Soho so I just spent a lot of time in this neighborhood and it's so steeped in history and such an interesting uh, area to obsess about in that it's kind of fun and but also fearsome in some ways that the the kind of the highest end of show business and the sort of the, the seamier end of, um, of the city coexist literally next door to each other. So that's something that I've always found kind of very compelling. I also have this recurring time travel fantasy, the idea of going back to a decade, a time that I didn't previously experience. And so I guess for a long time, the idea of going back to the 60s is an exciting prospect, but it's always tempered with this nagging feeling that, you know, to do that, you just, you just want to experience the good things about the 60s. And of course, not everything was good about the 60s, but so that was something that I guess becomes the point of the movie is like it's dangerous to romanticize the past. And the further you get away from something and your tendency to romanticize the good times and the bad times sort of starts to sort of take away from the reality of the decade. And so... I guess in a way the film is almost like a, a cautionary tale for time travelers. Be careful what you wish for. I started to wonder, I wonder if there's a way of doing two of these movies in one. Like you have a movie about a girl who comes to London in the modern day and then in her dreams she sees the journey of another girl coming to London in the 1960s. So it became this idea of this dual narrative and the idea of really getting to live somebody else's life through them. So you're living vicariously through somebody else's experiences. And because our, the, the character of our movie, Eloise, is obsessed with the 60s, initially the idea of going back to the 60s through this other character, Sandy, played by Anya Taylor-Joy, initially that is a very alluring, glamorous experience. And everything's going great until it isn't. Sandy is an aspiring singer and comes to London looking to make a splash. And I guess the story becomes not the good luck story of being in the right place at the right time, but the all too real tragedy of being in the right place at the wrong time. The irony is, is that I was initially thinking about her playing the part of Eloise and because I just saw her in The Witch and said, she's the perfect person to be the Eloise character in Last Night in Soho. So that was what I thought about as I was, the next couple of years went by, I made another film. Um, and 
then when I was starting to write last night in Soho with Christy Wilson Cairns, the character of Sandy was getting bigger. It was so as we started to write, we started to expand the Sandy scenes, both in terms of how many of them there were, how much dialogue there was in those scenes, and you know, and in, in including scenes like the audition scene, which wasn't in my initial outline, but like is something that we added to the the, the story and is one of my favorite scenes in the film. And as that character is starting to expand, and I've been watching Anya Taylor-Joy now in several films, and even just seeing her blossom into this amazing presence on the red carpet in terms of Anya just looks amazing in everything. And, and maybe I'd even seen her in some kind of like period look within a magazine. And then I started to think, you know what? Maybe Anya should play Sandy. Like, I'd like to see that. And I think as like Anya has this really timeless quality to her, do you think that she could be a movie star in like it now? She could be a movie star in the 60s. She could have been a movie star in the 20s. In the original outline for the story that I had done, we didn't have the audition scene in there. And it was actually Christie's suggestion that she, she said, I think we need one more scene in the 60s. And I think we need to see her perform to see how talented she is. So then we had this idea of like, she goes to the Rialto club after hours and sings a song for the talent booker, the owner of the club. Um, and, you know, as we're talking about this scene, I was looking at my list of songs that I wanted to have in the movie. And I said, she should sing downtown. She should sing for two Clark's downtown. I think I knew that Anya Taylor-Joy could sing. I was aware of that. Um, I didn't know. I didn't necessarily know until we did it how great her voice was, and so it was really great getting her to sing downtown, but to do it in. We did two versions of it. We did the one that was very similar to the Petula Clark version um, in terms of the tempo, and then we did a slower version, which is what is in the film and then in the trailer. So. We recorded both of these, and she'd rehearsed both of them. And I think it was literally the day before I was mulling over which one to use, and it was like, it's got to be it's got to be the a cappella slow one. It's so spine tingling. And it's a really beautiful moment in the movie for me because I think just seeing La Anya sing on screen uh, on that empty stage is 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 bewitching. Eloise is an 18-year-old girl coming to London for the first time to attend fashion college. And she's coming from the country, and coming to the big city can be a very intense experience for a newcomer. And Eloise is almost immediately disheartened because the London of now is not really what she dreamt it would be. And as somebody who's grown up on 60s music and culture and fashion, I think she had this utopian idea of what London can be that is, is, is maybe not entirely realistic because she's only been watching a certain movie or listening to certain music and has this fanciful idea of what it might be. And so the cold reality of London is, is tough to take for her. And because of this, she actually retreats from like the social circle on in her class and even m moves out of her halls of residences to find a place to be on her own. Eloise's visions of the past start to become more and more dramatic and intense and scarily visceral and ultimately it leads to her witnessing a tragedy and then it's up to her to solve the mystery of what happened to the girl who died in my room. I'm so glad that she's in the movie because I feel one of the real strengths of it is that you get to go on the journey with her. And there's something really powerful about casting somebody who's the same age as the character. Because as Eloise is going from the country to London and on this kind of, you know, kind of incredible odyssey, like, Thomason was also doing that by coming back from New Zealand to London to sort of like be in a movie where also we're shooting in a lot of the real locations. There's a very like visceral experience for her. And, and Thomason is one of those actresses who is incredibly naturalistic and wants to feel the experience um, as strongly as she can. So she really has to put herself in that mindset. 
And I guess in a way she was able to be in the story. And I was really impressed watching her, especially somebody of that age, to have such skill. And to be in a movie where you're in every single scene. She's the lead of the movie and there's not a scene that she's not in. <clears throat> and that's not difficult. That's not easy to do. And she pulled it off with a plomb. So I was just sort of amazed at watching her like essentially run this marathon by being in the movie. And I, I think you experience so much of the movie through her um, on every level that you needed somebody incredibly special to pull that off. Both Eloise and Sandy have dreams of making it big in London. In Eloise's case, she wants to be a fashion designer, and so she's going to the London College of Fashion to pursue her dream. And she's carrying a lot of weight of responsibility on her shoulders because she feels that she wants to triumph where maybe her mother failed. Her mother had a much tougher time in London, and so she feels that she wants to A, succeed for herself, but also for her mother, which is a lot of responsibility to take on. Sandy is coming to London to be a star, and I think in a way, I feel with her story, it's sort of the tragedy of the left turn and the way that life can deal you cards that you cannot do anything about. And I guess in some ways that was inspired by um, reading a lot about showbiz stories and inevitably tragic stories in show business about careers that might have been. When we first meet Jack in the Café de Paris nightclub, she's somebody that turns Sandy's head and, uh, and he's somebody who wants to get to know her and he's introduced to her as somebody who can make things happen, a showbiz manager, in fact. And, uh, and Jack is a very intoxicating person because, you know, Sandy has a lot of confidence. Jack is there to kind of like fuel that and sort of tell her that she can be a big star and make promises that he can make that happen. And I think he's a very forceful personality and Sandy ends up falling for him um, first as, a, as his client and then as a lover. And he's a very charming individual, but then you start to wonder what's kind of lurking underneath that charm. I've known Matt for a number of years and been a fan of him as an actor, but, and even though we've known each other socially, um, I've never really had like a part for him. And then when he first came up for Jack, I thought, oh, actually that's perfect. And there's something about Matt where you know, he's incredibly charming and um, I just, I guess I wanted to see the sort of the darkness that was beneath and bring some of that out to start to pull back the curtain of a performer who's incredibly personable and charming. On top of that, I think Matt, like, looks incredible in, like, a period setting. I totally and utterly buy him as, like, that if he was in the 1965 version of this film, like you could just slot him straight in there. So it was really great to get him to play that part and to, you know, channel other actors of the time. Um, and so it was it was really great fun to finally find something. Um, and it was great to send him the script and said, oh, I, I have a part for you. And he read it and he goes, yep, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> yes, I'm in. I always got the feeling with Terence that he was never entirely comfortable with with being like a, a, a 60s icon. Um, if you ask Diana Rigg about it, she would say, I was working for all of the 60s. The Avengers had me on a really tough schedule. <laughs> so I think for her, it was like she was, it was filming all the time and the 60s went by like that. And then Rita, in a way, when you would talk to her about it, would talk in very similar ways to Peggy, is that if you talked about the great times of the 60s, there was always this dot, dot, dot before, you know, some acknowledgement of like, but the times weren't always good. And, and that was really interesting to me because I, I, I had different variations of that story from all three of them. On top of that, I'm not just casting them because they are links to the past. They're also all incredible, like, working actors. And it's about what 
the weight and power they bring to the contemporary scenes that they're in. And so I just, the whole experience of working with all three of them, like I just felt so fortunate and what a privilege to be able to, you know, shoot with them like every day on the movie, it was incredible. The first meeting that we had about it was with our location manager, Camilla Stevenson, because once you've written the script, the very first thing you think about is like, can we pull this off in Soho? Because that's important. I don't really want to be recreating Soho like in another area. So we kind of grabbed the ball by the horns and said, we're going to make this film in central London. And so what that requires is an enormous amount of planning. Um, the amazing cooperation of the city of Westminster to let us actually shoot in areas of London that never close, even on a Sunday, like Soho doesn't shut. So you have to figure out a way to work around Soho to shoot scenes that take place in the modern day and to shoot scenes that take place in 60s London with period dressing and period cars and changing all the signs and changing all the ground floors of everything. And it was a, you know, a Herculean endeavor. And I think it's a credit to my location team, production team, uh, production design and ADs, all of the AD department that we were able to sort of pull it off. Because there were some days that I came to work and thought, I don't know whether we're gonna pull this off. <laughs> because it's like Soho is an area, it cannot be tamed. And so you had to figure out a way to make the movie with real life happening all around you. I was sitting in Los Angeles and I was thinking, last night in Soho was gonna be my next film. I, I really wanted to do something completely different um, that was a real departure for me, something that was a, a challenge in a lot of ways, something that was more serious, a film that had like female leads. Um, and I knew it was like the right thing to do is to sort of, after Baby Driver is, the, is to make uh, an original movie, like as, you know, rather than go straight into a sequel or to sort of like, you know, go off and do a franchise movie. It's like, if I have the opportunity to make an original film, I have to take it. The costume design was obviously a huge part of the process because it's actually, you know, baked into the plot in terms of the Eloise gets inspiration from the 60s and what this, the character of Sandy, who she's becoming obsessed by, is wearing. And that almost becomes the key to kind of her um, creative expression in the modern day and she starts to get some success on her course through being inspired by the girl who she sees when she goes to sleep. So with all that in mind, we knew that the first dress that Sandy is going to wear has to be like a knockout dress, but also something that in its way has its own personality. And so it's something where I feel like Sandy and the dress become kind of intertwined. Um, and the dress in itself kind of has sort of a quite ethereal feeling about it. You're in a dream state and she's got this kind of amazing sort of like floating dress of almost that she seems like a sort of shimmering mirage in a way. So we talked a lot with our amazing costume designer, Odile Dix Moreau, about what those uh, costumes would be and obviously taking a lot of um, inspiration from the past and looking at kind of dresses from the time and the material and um, the people wearing them and the designers. So that was, I mean, that's the fun part of it where you sort of get to sort of, you know, kind of turn back the clock and look at all these amazing fashions from the 60s. One of Adil Dix Moreau's credits was the film An Education um, which I thought did the 60s brilliantly and I, it stuck in my head as a film where I felt like the period work was really, really well done and didn't feel like it fell into those cliches that you sometimes get of like swinging London. Um, so I wanted to work with her and, um, you know, even just my first meeting with her was just like, 
and an explosion of like reference that was just like, oh, this is obviously the right person for the job. And she was really excited by the prospect of it. And and I guess in terms of Sandy's costumes, there's a, a, a way of, you know, showing narrative throughout the costume designs. And so that was something both with costume and hair and makeup, how we can tell Sandy's story and the arc of her journey through her costumes. When Eloise travels to the 60s, we wanted the film to feel a little different at that point, and there were a couple of things we did to achieve that. One was the, just about palette control in terms of we wanted the 60s to explode in colour. You know, obviously, like a lot of archive of the time, there's lots of black and white photography or, like, you know, like TV at that time wasn't necessarily in colour in the mid-60s. Um, but... There were a lot of films of the period that are shot in Technicolor. And uh, I always like like watching films from the 60s that are shot in like vivid, almost hallucinatory Technicolor. So that was the idea is that when we go into the mid 60s, we want to feel like we're going from not a black and white film into color, but more like a, a muted color film into a Technicolor film. And so that was something that we achieved um, partly just through the actual uh, colors that we're using within the scenes, within the costumes, within the set design, um, and also, and also, it was done by switching uh, the film. We were shooting on spherical lenses in the modern day scenes, and then switching to anamorphic lenses in the sixties. Chung is from South Korea. It was interesting to me to bring his eye to a London movie. Like, what? how does he see the city? So in the same way that Eloise is somebody who's coming from the country to London for the first time, you know, I have a, a cinematographer from South Korea who also works in other, you know, he's worked in the States a lot. He never shot a film in central London. And so I was always interested to see how he saw it. And... You know, we really kind of um, gelled immediately upon meeting. Like, he read the script, I showed him the storyboards, um, you know, reference material. And and obviously what he's achieved in his work is, like, just... He's an incredible cinematographer. So it was very exciting to work with him. And I think all of the crew and the cast, like, loved working with him as well because he's just one of those people who's so creative and in ways that are always a little unexpected. Like some of my previous movies, um, the, the, sometimes the songs inspire the scenes, or sometimes the songs are there as a reminder to make the movie. So, you know, I like I said, I had an idea for the story. I started making a little playlist of songs that I wanted to feature that conjured up the mood of the movie for me. And then sometimes if I heard that track randomly in the, you know, in the time before I'd started writing, say I heard R. Dean Taylor's There's a Ghost in My House, I'd be like, oh, I've got to make Last Night in Soho. So it would be these things almost like the kind of, the, the songs would be like post-it note reminders, you must make this film. Um, so those things like, so songs that sort of really drive the writing process for me because much like in the film Eloise like uses the music as a as a as a time travel machine essentially um you know the 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 sound of the 60s kind of like propels her back into that decade and i guess it was the same thing writing it is obviously like so evocative of the time the best that you could hope for with any film is that the audience feel like they've had an experience at the end of it. And I think in this movie, you get to go on a journey with Thomas and Mackenzie's character, Eloise. And she isn't the same at the end of the film, and hopefully neither are the audience. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I take this as a compliment. One of my friends saw an early cut of the movie, and he called me a couple of days later. He goes, I had a dream about your film. <laughs> he said, I had a dream about Soho and neon flashing. And uh, I couldn't get it out of my head. And I was like, well, good. 
<laughs> so that's the desired effect is that, you know, the film is about kind of these extremely vivid, like visceral visions. And, you know, if like somebody watches the movie and then when they close their eyes at night, they start thinking about things that they've seen in the movie, then that there's, you know, what more could you ask for? You know, the worst crime is like the movie where you've forgotten what even happened in the movie by the time you've gone, got to the parking lot. That's not good. So if, if people are sort of like thinking about the movie for a long time afterwards, um, if it's haunting them, then you've done your job. I have nothing against um, like watching things at home. During lockdown, I have probably watched upwards of 500 movies at home. However, I hope it's not controversial to say that the film is best experienced first on the big screen. It was designed for the big screen in terms of like the the look and the mix and just, you know, in a film where you're immersing yourself in like another world on the big screen, you get to go down the rabbit hole with Eloise in a way maybe doesn't work quite as well if you're looking at it on your phone. That's not again to sort of say that like you can't do that. But I would love people to have the opportunity to see it on the big screen. And so I'm very like sort of thankful that we were able to push the release so that that was possible because the idea of it just going straight to sort of like um, a home release was not something I was particularly kind of excited about because, you know, I make, I love going to the cinema. Like, I think the experience of sitting in the dark with strangers is, like, sometimes, like, more than half the fun. And, you know, you want to feel like you want to go on a journey with a movie. And there's no question that the big screen is more transportative.